put things here. Let me see if I can. So thank you. So let me just sorry. Let me just get it started here, and I will share my screen like this. Only a host can share this meeting, so I need to need a host. iPad, I guess. Can you see? Oh, yes. Well, let's see if I can share my screen now. Okay, good. Okay, great. So let's. Uh, Okay, so, so today I'm going to talk about something that I, I actually, it's in a sense, this is a continuation of something that I spoke on here, had spoken on here many years ago. So there will be some, some stuff here that, uh, that some of you may feel is somewhat familiar. However, there are, there are some new results that, that even those of you who are, uh, you know, have seen some of this before, hopefully some of this will be new. So. Anyway, so, so I'm going to be talking about this stuff related to a generalization. Of the Springer resolution. And so this is partly based on On joint work. Martha Precup and Amber Russell. And the main new result here, and I'll just kind of give you a preview before I sort of launch into things, will be that the fibers of this generalized Springer resolution has, and I'll put it in quotes because it's not really an affine paving, it's an quote affine paving, it's almost an affine paving. And we can explicitly identify the cells. So maybe I'll just tell you what an affine paving is, and then I'll just sort of tell you sort of what why I'm putting affine in quotes. And then at some point I'll reverse, I'll sort of go back to the beginning and talk about what is this. I'm telling you about talking about the fibers of some map that I haven't defined yet or, or so forth. But what I but, but I thought I would start off with saying something new before I start on go into saying something old. Now, what does affine mean? Well, what is an affine paving? So an affine paving, say of of a say, say a complex algebraic variety. It actually doesn't have to be complex. It could be over any field, but X is a filtration X zero containing X one containing X n or X I bet. X. This n has nothing to do with the dimension of x. It's just how, how many pieces there are, such that each 
xi is a closed, it's closed, and xi minus xi minus one is a disjoint union. of spaces isomorphic to, to C to the D. And that D of course can vary depending on I and stuff. I mean, I'm not, lots of different Ds are possible. <clears throat> so this is what I mean by it's an affine space. So affine here means that instead of CD, we get CD modulo some finite group. So for many practical purposes, this is as good as an affine paving. So you know, why might you be? So uh, it's actually, it will be like a subgroup of the center of the, well, not just something, so it's, it's a bunch of it's 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 a bunch of um it's a bunch of products of of uh, abelian groups. It's a direct product of like of cyclic groups. The quotient is not the well. The quotient is not affine. It's an affine variety, but it's not affine space. So affine space is like the word affine. Unfortunately, has a couple of different meanings. Sometimes it means like an affine algebraic variety, but no, no, I'm just wondering. No, it's not necessarily a reflection group. That's right. It's, no, no, it's not, not necessarily a reflection group. So, so now why might one be interested in, an in, a, in having an affine paving of the fibers of some map? So, and this, so why, why might we care? Well, if we had we had a map, say a, a proper map, pi from x to y of algebraic varieties. Then the stalks of the push forward of the constant sheaf have cohomology. So this is a sheaf push forward or drive sheaf push forward of cohomology isomorphic to or equal to maybe, I don't know. I'll just say the cohomology, cohomology of the of the fiber over some point y. That's what the, the, co, the stock over y has cohomology, of, which is the cohomology of the fiber of y. Any space with an affine paving. implies that odd dimensional cohomology vanishes. Now in affine, we apply the same thing and it provided your coefficients are, you know, are relatively prime to the finite group that you're quotienting out by. So, 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 you know the same say with rational coefficients as long as the I'll just say the same for this so what this means is that in other words sheaves where the cohomology only occurs in even dimensions are you know an example of parity sheaves and those are sort of important in modular representation theory and so this so this doesn't have to be qx it could be any x actually any field x so you could do this over you know a positive characteristic field for example and so, so this is kind of telling us that, tells us that pi star of Q of X, you know, is a parity sheaf. On Y. And so that's, so, so this, so although we don't really have, Yet applications in the modular case of this generalized spring resolution, this is giving us a an idea that it might have some 
it, it, it's a useful property to have. So that's at least one motivation for why you might care about the affine paving property. Okay, so that's, so now to back up from the, to go back to sort of the beginning or whatever, I should talk, tell you what this generalized Springer resolution is and you know where it comes from. And as I get, again, so, but I, I guess I should just back up for a second. All these things can be, in, in this particular case, we can explicitly identify the cells, we can identify the finite groups, I and mean, everything can be calculated more or less explicitly. So when I said the, in the main new result, you know, it's really quite, quite explicit. Okay, so we're, so let's, so going back, let me talk about, you know, the generalized Springer resolution. So, so most of you know what the Springer resolution is, but just to say in, in, a, in a certain terms, so the Springer resolution So uh, just as usual, we're going to take G contained in B, which is T times U. And we have the, and we, have the we use the Gothic letters for Lie algebras as usual. And and the Springer resolution then is this map from G cross upper B of U to the nilpotent cone. Mm -hmm. And what, what we take, so I use brackets to denote this quotient by G. It takes a, a, a coset G comma X just goes to what I would usually write is just G times X, which is really if you like add G of X. Now, now, many years ago, actually, when I was in graduate school, my advisor, David Vogan, was very interested in covers of nilpotent orbits. And because, in fact, you know, nilpotent orbits are not simply connected. And so I started to think at, you know, at his suggestion about the universal cover of the dense nilpotent orbit. So, so, so N contains this dense orbit. I'll just call it PR for principal orbit. That's what Costin called it. And this is, this is, uh, sorry, N contains this. So sometimes this is called, this is, usually, this is sometimes called N tilde. Mm -hmm. So N contains O principal, which is the principal orbit and the fundamental, and I'll take G here to be simply connected just to. So the fundamental group of the principal orbit, it's the center of G which is the center of G. So in the case we're most interested in for most of this talk, it will be G is SLN, and then Z is just ZN. If this part of the talk, however, is, is for all types, but the paving part is only, it, it's, it's, at this point, it's only for SLN. So one can define, M to be, well, sorry, let me back up for a second here. It turns out that N, its spec of the regular, fun R of N is just the regular functions on N. And that is also, it turns out, just spec of the regular functions on the principal orbit, because any, any function on the principal orbit actually extends to a function on the entire nilpotent cone. And so, so na a natural variety to define then is you could define a variety, I'll call it M, to be spec of R of O of the universal cover. So O of PR, it's the universal cover. And so the, in a sense, M is a more interesting variety than N in certain respects. This may be heretical in this if among certain people in this room, perhaps we some might argue nothing is more interesting than N, but at least in certain respects, N is more interesting than N. For example, as a representation 
of G, the functions on N contains only representations where only five, you decompose this in terms of finite dimensional representations, contains only representations where the highest weight is in the root lattice. And each representation occurs with multiplicity. Equal to the dimension of the zero weight space, which is the which is actually the largest weight space. But as a represent, but but R of M, R of M. That's right. No, it's it's because you can view N as a degeneration. As a limit of, of, of a semi simple orbit. And for a semi simple orbit, it's just like this it's G mod T. Right. And right. so the semi, so then it's induction from T to G. And so, and, and so by taking the limiting process preserves the multiplicities. And that's actually, that's actually how Costin basically proved it, in fact. Right. And, um, but, but R of M itself actually contains all representations. All finite dimensional representations. And each occurs with multiplicity equal to its largest dimensional weak space, which is the one closest to zero, basically. So I don't know, that's a kind of a But to make, let me, I cannot resist doing one really concrete example of this. Just to, I mean, many of you have seen this maybe, but, but it, if we look at SL2, you know, N, it's a set of, we can say it's a set of all, you know, X, Y, Z minus X, such that X squared plus Y, Z equals zero, right? That's the, that's what the nil potent cone is in SL2. And it turns out that, that, in this case, M is just C2. And the map from M to N can be written as saying taking to N, can be written as taking say UV goes to something like UV minus UV U squared. And I think it has to be a minus V squared here. So, so I don't know. So C two is a little bit nicer than this quadric cone. So I mean, this is this is some some argument that it, it's nicer anyway. So so the question that one might ask then is, can we complete this diagram? Well, yeah. Is M normal? Yes. Okay. Because it's because R of R of this this thing that it's this is this because it's O tilde is smooth. That is an integrally closed ring, and therefore in its fraction field, and therefore M is normal. So yes, M is sort of normal almost, but it's because O tilde is 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 smooth. So the question is, can we complete this diagram by finding? M tilde. So we'd like something where we had I'm not sure my font here. Right, so I, I should back up. So I, maybe I'll just say it say in word in a second. So th this bottom map occurs because R of O until the principle, the print, these functions contain the functions on O, o principle. Only, may I just, sorry. Contain R of O principle. 
And when you have a map on rings, it induces a map on the specs in the opposite directions. So and this gives the, the map on the specs in the opposite direction gives m to n. So that's why you have that map. So the right vertical map we've explained already. So the question is, but we still need to construct m tilde and then show that all these maps exist. So let me explain this a little bit here. And so I'm not going to super rush through this. I mean, I could try and it, I suppose there's always the possibility of needing another speaker at some point. So I, I feel like there's no point in me trying to do this super fast when it when it might be better for the seminar. If, <laughs> if I would. So I'll just go through it and we'll see how far we get. But I mean, there's, there's a bunch of things one could say about this, but so let me so so the question is how to construct how to construct m tilde. So the difference between the difference in the sense that I don't like between m and n is in a sense that the center z acts trivially on n but faithfully on m because it's a it's, it's actually m mod z but m mod z is actually equal to n so so z x so z x actually acts faithfully so we want to get a, so we want a variety so we want M tilde, where Z acts faithfully. But M tilde should resemble N tilde. So we want a variety resembling N tilde. So here's how we can do this. So the basic idea is the following. So let so the adjoint group, it's G add, which is a simply connected group mod the center. And the T add is the torus of this, which is the T mod the center. Now, if we look at U, so let, let me, and I'm going to just focus on SLN here, although at this point everything is still general, but let me just imagine we're dealing with SLN. So, what does U look like here? I'll just not worry about these for a second here. Now, if you look at if you look at these three spaces here, so these are the this is the space this is the subspace of U spanned by the simple root sim, simple root spaces. So I'm going to give this a name. So let's let V be the subspace. A view spanned by by simple root spaces. But I'm actually going to I want to I want to associate this with the adjoint group. So I'm going to put a little add here to indicate that it's associated with the adjoint group. And the reason is because the simple roots. Form a basis. For, for I'll call this T hat add, which is the characters of the adjoint torus. So it's the character group of the adjoint torus. The roots, the characters of the adjoint torus are just the root lattice. And this is the this is actually the root lattice. What this means is that the add the natural action back up, we have an embedding T add into V add. And basically T in this case is just going to go to T acting on acting on the subspace I'm just going to act take T and I'm going to act on this vector 
And when I act on this vector, what I get really is, I get, if you like, the way I might write this down, is I might write this as e to the alpha one of t, the first root, e to the alpha two of t, and e to the alpha three of t. But it's just acting by the by the roots, by, by the root characters of the roots on that torus. And because of this, this is actually an, 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 an embedding because it's because the character, it's, it's again because the roots span the character lattice. So, in other words, V add contains, it's a, it's a, it's a T variety. It's a T add variety, so it has a T add action. It contains T add as an open subset, because that is an open that's a dense that's an open dense subset that you get by acting that way. And it's normal because it's just in fact V add in this case is just it's just C to C3 in this case, but in general it's C C to it's just it's just actually a vector space. So these things mean that V add is a toric variety. For, for T add. There's a normal variety which has a dense, which has a torus action and has a, an embedding of the, the torus as a dense open orbit is a toric toric variety. Now, there's a general procedure if you have, if you have a covering of tori, so this is a covering. T add is T mod Z. And you have a torque variety. So then you have this torque variety here. What you can do is you can make a torque variety that fits here. And that's the torque. And you can see, and this is, it's a general, it's a very simple torque variety construction that allows you to do this. And so, Maybe I will explain this a little bit for SL3. Since I think this is kind of interesting. So I don't know, since if we're not in a huge rush, I can explain this very concretely. This general procedure is really very simple. So how does this work? Well, maybe, maybe, maybe let me tell you, in fact, let me not tell you how this works at this exact instance. Let me tell you how we put this in and make the generalized Springer resolution. And then perhaps if there's time or I can, or maybe in some other talk, I can say how we do this. But let's accept the fact that we can make this torque variety. It's a very, it, it's a very concrete construction that one can actually analyze. But let's just leave this for the moment. Now, the project, so there's, so the way I described it, so as described, V add is a subspace of U. But in fact, there's a natural projection as well, because I can just project onto the coordinates. And that projection is moreover, it's not just a projection, it's an equivariant for the action of the Borel group. It commutes with the action of the Borel subgroup because V can be V add can be identified with U mod the bracket U bracket U. And so and so then the natural map. If we, if we view it that way, there's a natural map here, which is V, which is B equivariant, because everything here is equivariant for the Borel. So, so what we can do then, so I want to make a variety U tilde. I just want to plug in V in place of V add. Because the center by construction acts faithfully on V, because V is a toric variety for the, this nicer torus, which contains it. I can't just plug it in because I have to get, I have to do this in a B equivariant way, right? So I have to be sure that what I'm doing is B equivariant. But what I can do is that I have, I, I have maps, we have maps from U to V add. And we have, and we have, we also have, which I described above, and we also have a map from V to V add. 
And these are both B equivariant maps. UX trivially here on here. So what I can do is I can make a, I can make U tilde. Whenever you have two things mapping to the, the same thing, you can say this is going to be this fiber product U cross over V. Oh, maybe I'll say it this way, V over V add of U, which very concretely, it's just a set of all pairs, X, Y in V cross U, such that they map to the same point. In V add. In effect, as a space, this is just V cross basically U bracket U. It's V, the, the upper stuff, higher stuff. It's just it, concretely, it's just it's as a space. But this, this description up here means that it has a B action because everything here is constructed using maps that are B equivariant. So that's why you want to use that description formally. But as a space, it just looks like V cross a vector space. But this shows the B action. And so then, so then we can define, we then have a natural map U tilde going to U, which is this projection onto the second coordinate. Because if you have this fiber product, as it's called, then you have this projection onto that second coordinate there. So we define. We define M tilde to be G cross upper B of U tilde. Now, because U tilde maps to U, this we get this maps to N tilde, which is G cross B of U. This maps to N here. This maps to M. But it's actually not completely obvious that this map exists, right? That's that, that actually is something that at this point, all these maps so far, the top map is obvious from the construction, but this map, it's not completely obvious that this map exists. And so the theorem is that the left-hand map exists and is an isomorphism over like, the universal cover of the principal or which is contained in both of these things. Here. That, that's contained in here. And that one has to show that, I guess, but one can show that this O till the PR is contained in this spec of it. So it's, it's R. Okay. So that 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 is um, is a theorem, and it, it you know it it requires some. Well, that's ex that's actually my next comment here. Unfortunately, M it's M tilde looks like something smooth modulo a finite group. <laughs> So it's close to a resolution of singularities. And for certain purposes, it's as good as a resolution of singularities, but it's not actually quite a resolution of singularities. Now this can be remedied in two ways in two ways. So so M tilde is not smooth. This can be fixed. So If you want, by so so the, so the reason is that so the reason for this is just that so the reason for that factor so the reason is basically that v itself is smooth modifying. The only thing that we've done 
to change things is we replace v out, which is the vector space, by v. And v is not smooth, it's smooth mod of finite group. So to fix it, there's a, there's a, a standard procedure for where you can take a, tor a resolution of singularities in the, in the setting of toric variety. So you take a toric resolution. So you can fix this by, you take a toric resolution, you know, the, if you want to, toric resolution of singularities. And then, then M hat would be would be G cross B. Of, I'll just say U hat. We just do this. And just put a hat there. However, it's probably better not. I mean, you could, this is useful in doing certain kinds of proofs, but it's probably better to just think of M, M tilde itself as being pretty much as good as something smooth. If you really need to use something, have something in a proof that is smooth, you can do this. So when I was originally thinking about this, in fact, there was a way you know, in, the, in the paper, I did use this way. There was a different way I wanted to do to avoid using this, but it would have involved extending some things that were smooth for, that were known for smooth varieties to orbifolds, which I, I'm confident could be done, but I just at some point I just decided I needed to get this finished, so I didn't do it. So I, so you can actually use this this method to sort of get around that. And but you should think of M tilde as being you know close to as good as smooth for certain purposes. So so the U tilde comes from no, you you no you you it's you really comes from the adjoint group. Oh. U tilde is made by using v. So if we go back up here, so u itself is from the adjoint group because Lie algebra, Lie algebra only really sees the adjoint group. It doesn't the center the center acts trivially on the Lie algebra. That's is kind of what's happening. So, so, so U is from the adjoint group, and the whole point of U tilde is to get something that is more associated with the simply connected group, in a sense. So, so I, so at this point, so at this point, maybe it would just be helpful if I do a simple, a, a low dimensional toric example to show you how concrete this is. And I mean, this is, so, so in any event, so the point, the main theorem then, so the main theorem I, I talked about at the start of the paper, so the main new result, or I mean at the start of this talk, the main new result, it, it, we're, it's actually considering the fibers of this composition, not M tilde to N, but going all the way down to N. In fact, in fact, that really doesn't make any difference because although it's not really necessary here, I think this bottom map is one-to-one, -one, surprisingly, is one-to-one -one off the principal no post orbit. So in fact, I think it doesn't matter whether you go down to M or to N, but, but in any event, we're, we're just going all the way down to N for simplicity. So the main new result, I talked about the fibers. So the fibers that it concerns are the fibers of the composition map from M tilde to N. The fibers are the fibers of M tilde to N. So you go all, you take you go all the way down to the bottom here. You don't go to, you don't stop it at M itself. Now I will say just something else that I, I could at some point talk about, but I don't have to, is that it turns out that it for SLN, so we spent a lot, when I say we, I mean Martha and Amber and I have spent most of our time looking at in detail at SLN. It turns out for SLN, this, this generalized Springer resolution is very closely connected to Lustig's generalized Springer correspondence. Mm -hmm. So in type, so for SLN, this, this N tilde to N is closely connected And so, in fact, 
part of the thing, part of the reasons to have an affine paving also is to actually sort of make this connection a bit deeper in the sense because you can you can get some numerics that are connected with these things because you can count you can commute you can compute Betty numbers out of this affine paving and from that you can get some dimensions of some stocks of least in of things in least things generalized variant correspondence so that's a, another reason but I, I I guess I just at this point I've talked a lot about smooth modulo finite group and this all might seem a little bit abstract so I think I just like to take a moment and and you know, explain a little bit the toric stuff, which I think is rather interesting. And you know, then as I said, I'm happy to talk some other time about this. But give some more details. But but I think if nobody, if I I think if most of the times I've talked about this, I haven't really had much chance to say the toric stuff, which is, is sort of interesting. So the toric toric stuff. So a toric, an affine toric variety for a torus, I'll say for T add. So what is it, what is what is what is what do you do to start off? You take the character group of T add. So this is just it's a it's a it's a it's a bunch of Z, it's a product, it's just a you know, it's an integer lattice. And then you take some real vector space, I'll call it V, which is T add tensor R, which is just Rn, and it contains T add as a hat as a lattice. And so for SL3, and the way we usually would draw this, we don't draw our lattice as we know in rectangle, you know, just on the xy axis, we usually would draw our lattice to be something like this. I'm going to sort of, I don't, I'm not saying I could really do a good job drawing this, but, but basically what we're going to do is, is we basically draw some kind of hexagonal picture here. And then we just sort of extend like this. So, we, you know, we get this kind of hexagon type thing. And then the lattice is this hexa, hexagonal thing sitting inside there. And so then this is the root alpha one, and this is the root alpha two. And so then, the toric, a toric variety, an affine toric variety for, for T add, it's just given by, an affine variety is given by its ring of functions. Which is given by a cone in V intersect T hat add. And how do we how do we explain this? So, for example, if I look at in SL three, continue with SL three. Suppose T add x on the root space is say C two, which also with weights say. Now, let me pause for a second here. There's always an issue of using positive or negatives here, because when you do functions, you put minus signs in, and then you get dual minuses. So let me not worry. Too. So if I have the signs slightly wrong, don't worry about it in this case. It's just, you know, if you have a, if you have a function, you have to put an inverse into the action of functions that introduces certain minus signs. And I don't really want to try and worry too much about this right now. So let's, I, think it, I think what I wanted to do is I want this to be minus alpha one. No, I actually, I guess I want it to be alpha one and alpha two. But okay, so then, so then, the functions, you know, c two is of course spec of c of x one, x two, right? Those are the functions on x one or x two. But as a function on the torus, remember t is sitting inside here. T add, sorry. And as a function, so so x one and x two can be viewed as functions on T add, and they are the functions actually e alpha one and e alpha two. That's what those functions are. So, in other words, this is the this can be written if we like as the ring e of alpha one and e of alpha two, and so. 
it, that corresponds in, in this cone picture here to the cone here that looks like this. Because if you think of this as like, this is uh, the exponent here, this is alpha one plus alpha two, you should sort of think of this as corresponding to e to the alpha one times e to the alpha two, because it's e to the alpha one plus alpha two. So if you think, if I go out here, this is two alpha one, that corresponds, if you like, to e to the alpha one squared. So basically, the rule for the rule is that this the cone, so a function. Oh, let me just back up the thing here. So the rule, the, the way I get the cone is that the cone says that a function. e to the a of alpha one plus a one alpha one plus a two alpha two is a function on C two, if and only if a alpha one plus b alpha two lies in the cone, which in this case just means a is big, a one is beginning to zero. Sorry, this should be an a two here. And a two is bigger than equal to zero. Okay, so and then that that makes sense because we know, so so we see that you know, e to the minus alpha one, that's one over x one. That's not a function on c two because it, it's not defined on all of c two. It has it's it's not defined on the entire space. So when I say it's a function on, on all of c two. Okay. So what, so what you can do to make your torque variety for, so to make your torque variety for, for T, you keep the same cone, but replace T hat A, which is the root lattice, by t hat, which is the weight lattice. So you get more functions here. So what you're going to get, in fact, and I'm not, I, I'm not going to try and draw this, but here you get something like you have lambda 1, or I guess this is lambda 2 here, I guess. And you're going to get something like lambda 1. And you're going to get all the alphas plus all the lambdas in there. You have this lattice that's generated by, instead of just alpha one and alpha two, you have a lattice that's generated by alpha one, lambda one, lambda two, and alpha. And so what you need here, so the, what the functions you get, so for SL3, and it's actually a little bit more complicated for SL4 and stuff because, but for SL3, what you get is that V, the functions on V here. So when we said V add with a C2, this looked like the polynomial ring in, in E to the alpha one and E to the alpha two. And we call this C of X1, X2 flight. So here, I still have to take E to the alpha one, E to the alpha two, but I also need E to the lambda one and then you need e to the lambda two. So in a sense, I have four generators here. I'll call them w1 and w2 for the moment. But v itself is not a polynomial ring because it's not just generated by two of those. I actually need all four of those generators there. I can't get, I, I can't re remove any of those generators. So there, so there are relations here. And the relations here, for example, well, we know that we know, for example, that that um, that alpha one is equal to, I guess it's a two lambda one minus lambda two or something like that. So you're going to get some kind of relation here that tells you that x one is w one squared over w two, or you can put it in obvious. So there's various relations here coming from the relations in this thing. So you, so in other words. It's, if you like, you're really modging up by some ideal here. And the ideal has relations coming from the relations between the, the weights and the roots. And so the reason, so you can see that V is not smooth because a torque variety is smooth if and only if the cone, 
because a toric variety is smooth, an affine toric variety is smooth. If and only if the cone intersects the lattice is spanned by vectors on the edges. In other words, it's like a simplicial cone. So, so if we so if we're doing the so v add is smooth. That's fine because we, our cone looks like this. We have all these, the cone dot the lattice looks like this. We have alpha one here, alpha two. They lie on the edges and everything inside can be written as a linear combination of these two vectors that lie on the edges. But if we do V, then you get these other things here that you can't get rid of that lie in the middle. And so the cone that the cone intersect the lattice is therefore not generated by stuff that lies on the edges. And therefore it's not smooth. So, so that's so, but what you can see is that this is actually rather concrete. And let me tell you how you can, how you can further analyze V a little bit. So how, I said that V is not smooth. But but V is but I said that V is smooth modulo a final group. Well, how does that work? Well, I can define some V V uh, tilde here, and I'll just write it for SL three. So define V tilde to, to correspond to the same cone, but the lattice get spanned by. By, again, this is SL3 here. One third alpha one and one third alpha two, right? I can take a, I can take a lattice by just rescaling this. At this point, now again, this lattice, the cone is generated by stuff that's on the lattice. This is one third alpha one and one third alpha two. But I fix this problem because we know we know that lambda one. We sort of have fixed things. So this lattice contains the weight lattice. Because as we know, lambda one is something like two thirds alpha one plus one third alpha two. Lambda two, it's one third alpha one plus two thirds alpha two. So it contains the weight lattice, which contains the root lattice. And so what that gives us here is this gives us this picture, this gives us V tilde goes to V, goes to V add. This here is a Z3 quotient. The weight lattice mod the root lattice is Z3. And then this quotient here, well, because I'm dividing through by three in each factor, this quotient here is a Z3 cross a Z3 quotient. And so this quotient here that's left is actually also a Z3 quotient in this case. And so you can see that how this is going to work. And it's, of course, things are going to get bigger for bigger n. You're going to get more factors. But this is, but, but, but this is, you can analyze the V tilde itself is now a very simple space. V tilde is just C2 again. So this is C2. You have C2, then something in the middle that is not C2, and you go all the way down to this C2 at the bottom. And so you can analyze this C2, this thing in the middle rather explicitly by looking at the stuff above it and below it. And so when we do our stuff with the affine paving, some of it involves just analyzing this situation carefully. And so I'm now just at the, let's the last thing I said. So the, to, to show that the, that the generalized Springer fibers have an affine paving, Basically, you analyze the toric maps 
And what you have to do is you have to relate to the known fact that the regular, that the ordinary Springer fibers have an affine paving. So you have to relate to the known affine paving of the regular Springer fibers. Sorry, so just, just to try to yes. understand this better. So these finite groups basically come from the link lines modulus. Yeah, although what you're going to get going from B tilde to, to V yeah. is you're going to get a bunch of products of Z modulo sum. So basically, so, so in SL4, for example, right. what you, you get V tilde, which would be C3, and then you get something, you'd get V, and you go down to V add. This is a Z4 quotient. So then here, this is like a Z4 cross Z4. Now you get three Z4s because your quotient here. So here you get a group that looks like, you know, Z4 cross Z4 cross Z4, you know, modulo Z4 sitting in there somehow. Right. So you get some, so you're going to get some kind of groups here that look like basically things coming from the root lattice mod, the, the weight lattice mod, the root lattice, but you, but you, you know, they're, they're, if you need to look at V tilde to V, you're getting things that are, things that are kind of put together by that. So, so you know that so the so the, that's why I said it gets a little bit more complicated for SL four. Also for SL four, you can't you can't just use the fundamental dominant weights. You have to switch. You have to change them a little bit mm -hmm. because you know for SL four, what happens is that lambda one, it's it's um three fourths alpha one plus one half alpha two plus one fourth alpha three. And lambda two, it's one half alpha one plus alpha two plus one half alpha three. And lambda three, it's one fourth alpha one plus one half alpha two plus one uh, plus three fourths alpha three. And the problem is that your cone, the generators lambda one and lambda two and lambda three are not quite the generators because, oops. Because this is not the minimal element here, because if you because you can change because alpha two is in the root lattice, and so there's a smaller element in the cone which you have to use, and then you have to replace this by mu two, which is one half alpha one plus one half alpha three. That's in the same cone, but it's a little smaller because you because you've been able to remove that thing that was in the root lattice that is in the cone also. So. So for higher SLs, you have to do it. It's a little bit more complicated in that you have to throw out, you have to basically, you know, throw out the integer parts of these things to get the smallest ones possible. So, but it's it's kind of appealing because it's all stuff that you can analyze very concretely in this, in a sense, and you can, you know, and it's sort of miraculous in a way because, I mean, maybe if I talk about it at some point later, because some of the common torques with tableau, the, the Springer fibers pavings are connected with tableau and some of the common torques, you kind of see like some weird connection with these representations of, so, you know, the, the Springer correspondence for SLN gives you representations of SN, but the generalized Springer correspondence gives you representations not only of SN, but of SN over D for some N over Ds as well. And you see these in terms of the, you can sort of see these kind of in terms of the tableau that you get for this paving. So it's, it's kind of, there's some interesting connections that, 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 you know, we haven't, you know, fully figured out how to prove everything that Lustig proves by any means, but, but you can see in a geometric way kind of these shadows and these generalized Springer correspondence and you know, there's more to be done, I think, so. Okay, so that's all. Uh, so maybe we should stop recording unless we want to. I mean, I can continue next week with this a bit if people would like to hear more. Okay, so any questions? Yes. Um, well, I mean, well, I, I mean, it, 
in a sense, it is explicit. I mean, it's, it's defined as this, as this kind of bundle over G mod B. What, for SL2, I will tell you that for SL2, it's the, so for SL2, it, it's very, it can be made very explicit. So for, so for SL2, so N, N tilde, so I don't know what you mean by explicit. I mean, you, you can write it down as a, as a, as a, as some kind of a bundle over G mod B. Yeah, I don't know, actually. That's, that's a, well, I mean, yeah, I'm actually not sure if the, I mean, I guess I'm not sure about that. Um, I can tell you though, in any, let me just tell you what I was going to say. So, so n to n till the, it's the cotangent bundle, which is the cotangent bundle of P1. And this is just the total space of, of the sheaf, which is in Kartra and you would be three by O of minus two. M tilde is some kind of thing that's qu not quite a double cover of this. So there's sort of a natural thing that you might guess would be a double cover of O of minus two, that would be O of minus one. In fact, what this is, this is actually, total, this corresponds to O of minus one. That's so what you do if you like, this goes down to C2, and this goes down to the nilpotent cone, and this is like the blow up of C2 at the origin, in fact. So, it's a very, I mean, but for other things, it's, you know, I mean, you say, you know, can, you, can one describe them explicitly? I mean, I don't know that in terms of what, I mean, they're not something that people have really studied before. So you can't really say, say it's like something else exactly, but it's, I mean, it's a space that you can, you can analyze explicitly. And, uh, in a sense, that's how we do understand the fibers, is because we look at the these this, the, these generalized fibers will sort of lie over the Springer fibers, and so that's basically once you know you know a lot about the Springer fibers, and you just have to see kind of how many pieces of this lies above each piece of the Springer fiber. So, is there any sense in which the is you know almost smooth? Do you know anything about the singular focus? Well, I, I mean, I think smooth mod finite group is almost smooth, but <laughs> but so that, but I mean, I mean the thing, you know, it's it's got the it's got the the principle or O tilde right is sitting there as an open set, and it's probably going to be and but I mean the singular locus would basically be what the singular locus of V is. So the singular locus would be probably something like G cross over V of the singular locus. Of, of V sitting inside there. And that, I mean, it, it might be the complement of the open orbit. I'm not actually sure I'd have to, I have to, and that SL2 is a little bit different because V itself is smooth in SL2 because there's not too much you can do, do there. So, so M, M tilde here is actually smooth. It's not just an orbital, or it's not just smooth on finite. But in other cases, I mean, but that's something that I think one could easily analyze because one could easily, you know, I think, figure out the singular locus of this torque, right? There must be some, somebody must have done that already. In fact, we, you know, figured out what the singular locus of a torque, right? Is. It might be the complement of the open orbit in this case. But I mean, I, the way I try and think of it is I think of it as being, you know, until it itself is, you know, in certain ways, it's almost as good as smooth. In some ways, it's it's better, and as I said, because orbifolds are have their own appeal anyway. So, no, I don't. No, it's that's not the case. In fact, because what happens is that v itself. So v over v add. This is a finite. This this is a finite union of orbits. And so so you, so these orbits in here. 
uh, if you use Fulton's notation, or this is kind of bad notation, I only want to remember off the top of my head, you would have some kind of orbit where tau is some face of the cone. Maybe I'll call this O add because it's in the add. And sitting above here, there's an O of tau because you have the same face of the cone. So the orbits from in V and in V add are indexed by the same thing, the faces of the cone. And generally speaking, there's going to be some non-trivial fiber from O to O tau to O add tau. So, so you wouldn't necessarily, that doesn't necessarily prove that, that it's, that, that the points in O tau are smooth or not smooth, but the fact that these, the number of these stabilizers is jumping around is telling you that there's like, there, there's a good chance that there's going to be some kind of non-smoothness there. So I wouldn't, but, but I think you could figure out like, I mean, basically there's a finite number of orbits. And so the question is like, the smoothness is the same on every orbit. So you'd be, be understanding, you know, which orbits were smooth, consistent smooth points. Oh, that's a good question. I mean, it's a. Uh, I mean, I. It, I mean, the fibers of all these maps, actually, you know, can be have been computed actually. So I I gave sort of a recipe, for doing this in my original paper, but then I did the compute. I made a mistake doing the computation. So Amber Russell fixed the mistake in my original computation. So that. So, it, but it's not too, it's not, not too hard to, to compute actually in a sense. It's like it, it, in type D, it gets a little bit, a little bit complicated. So are you going to explain in your next talk why M tilde is better? Well, I, I, I thought I tried to convince you that M was better. So if you believe that M is better, <laughs> then, well, M tilde is better in a sense because it's also, you can also sort of see the, the, the generalized Springer correspondence from N tilde, whereas from N, as I said, in type A, whereas in N tilde, I didn't explain that. I could actually, I could actually talk about that next week because of this paving stuff, maybe. I don't know. I mean, the point is that, you know, M tilde is a little bit better because you see the generalized Springer correspondence there, whereas with N tilde, tilde you only see the Springer correspondence. So that's another reason. It's, but only in type A somehow, so, so in, in other types. It's because somehow, I mean, I haven't thought about this, but I'm told the reason you, you, it doesn't work is because you all you don't get all the nilpotent orbits by looking at the stuff that's right above the diagonal and the simple root spaces in other types. So you so in other types you miss some of the nilpotent orbits with this construction. So so anyway, but um, so I think, uh, but that's another reason M totally is better. If you don't, if you're not happy with the fact that M is better. <laughs> I, don't know, I thought it was better because my advisor told me to start working on it. So, <laughs> so let's thank the speaker. Uh -huh. I did this all last year when I was in the I don't really think it's